Well, last month we commemorated Mother's Day, the third highest day for church attendance every year, followed or Easter and then Christmas Day and then, uh, then Mother's Day. Father's Day typically is more average, sometimes below average in attendance, maybe because it's farther into the summer. Maybe it's because there's this perception that on Mother's Day, we honor and, and praise moms, but on Father's Day, we beat up and beat down dads. Well, men, I've decided to step out of Acts today and uh, speak to us as men, and I'm hopeful you won't feel beat up or beat down, but you'll receive some encouragement, you'll feel uplifted, and also that you'll be challenged to be the best uh, version, an even greater version of the man that God has called you to be. And ladies that are here this morning and, and kids that are here this morning, that doesn't mean there's nothing for you in the message. Um, the message applies to all, but certainly it can help you know how to pray uh, for the men in your life. Thirty years ago, a, a, a man, a pastor by the name of Steve Farrar, wrote a book called Point Man. You can see mine is uh, pretty worn. Point Man, although it was written 30 years ago, in my mind is timeless. And if you're a man, um, next to God's word, this is something you ought to read. Um, incredible truths for men on how to be the men that God has called them to be. And I want to start this morning just reading the opening uh, narrative from Point Man as kind of a launch for us uh, this morning in our message to men. It's 1966. You're 18 in the prime of your youth. You have a driver's license, a girlfriend, and some pretty big dreams. You've got an incredible life ahead of you, but through a strange series of circumstances, your driver's license is suddenly useless, your girlfriend's picture is tucked away in your wallet, and your dreams are on hold. You're in a country thousands of miles from home. Welcome to Vietnam. On this particular morning, you're headed out on patrol. You've been on patrol before, but today is different. There's a knot in your gut and icy fear gripping your heart because today the patrol leader has appointed you to be point man. As a point man, you're the leader. The seven other men on patrol will fall in behind you. As you move out to encounter the enemy, you realize the survival of those seven men will depend on your ability to lead. Your judgment will determine whether they live or die. That responsibility hangs heavy on you. Your sense is on high alert. Your adrenaline surging. Intelligence has told you the enemy is near, perhaps watching you right now, but you don't know where they are. As you cautiously make your way through the rainforest, you have one eye watching for concealed wires on the path and the other scanning the trees for snipers. You've heard the stories of entire patrols being lost because the point man failed to anticipate an ambush. You know men who have been killed or maimed because the point lack skill and wisdom. Despite your best efforts, you never saw it coming. The violent shock and utter surprise of gunfire momentarily paralyzes you. A glance to your left tells you that the family of the patrol leader is now fatherless. Two other men beside the patrol leader were hit. One is dead, the other bleeding profusely. You realize a bullet has pierced your leg, but it's gone through cleanly. You're luckier than most guys on point. They're usually dead before they hit the ground. As you radio a chopper for the hemorrhaging pilot, the hidden enemy unleashes all his firepower on your position. You're surrounded. In your gut, you know the odds are against you. You're outnumbered and outgunned. Two men are dead. One is dying. Four are wondering if they'll make it to lunch. The worst case scenario has happened, and it's worse than you ever imagined. Now is the time your leadership will make the difference. What you say and do will determine whether your men live or die. Now, some of you in this room and in the venue did not have to use your imaginations as I read that account. Whether it was Vietnam or the Gulf, Afghanistan or Iraq, you've been there. You felt the concussion of a grenade or an IED. You've been in firefights. You've been in the thick of battle. You know the adrenaline rush, the life or death scenarios. You've lost buddies in those battles. But let's change the scenario, and let's put every man in this room into that narrative, whether or not you've ever been in a battle before or not. You're still on patrol. You're still in the jungle. 
You're still the point man deep into enemy territory. You're still responsible for the lies that are lined up behind you. But as you look over your shoulder, what you see is not seven men. You see your family. It's your wife and your children behind you. Your little girl is choking back tears of fear. Your boy is trying to act very brave. Your wife's holding the baby and trying to keep him quiet. And on this patrol, your objective is not to engage the enemy, but your objective is to avoid the enemy. And the, the survival of your family depends on your ability to, to lead. You've got to lead them through a maze of ambushes. You've got to, got, got to lead them through unseen tripwires and traps. You've got to be on the lookout for those snipers that aren't visible. The survival of your family depends on you. It's all on your shoulders. You're the leader. Well, that's not an imaginary scenario, is it? If you're a husband and you're a father, you know well that Satan has declared war on the family, on, on your family. And you're leading your family every day. You're leading your family through enemy-occupied territory. It's going to take incredible wisdom and courage for you to lead them. The Apostle Peter, in his first letter to the churches that were scattered throughout Asia Minor, gave some great uh, instruction, some very simple advice. It sounds like it was written to men who were on point, men who were leading their family in enemy territory. In 1 Peter 5, 8, he says these words, be sober-minded or be self-controlled. Be watchful, be, be alert. Why? Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Sounds like good advice for a point man. You know, men, Satan's first objective is to devour you, and then once he's done that, he has ready access to your family. Be self-controlled, be alert. Your adversary prowls around seeking someone to devour. Let me invite you this morning to turn back to the beginning. Let's look at the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3. And men, while you're turning there, I'll go ahead and let you in on the end of the message this morning, the application. Really, it's just one word of application today. If you're going out on patrol as the point man, how much more prepared would you be to protect those in your care if you had a map that marked all the locations of the enemy? Or what if you had intelligence, very up-to-date, timely intelligence, that revealed every trap of the enemy? What if you had information or instruction on every weapon that the enemy would use against you and how to neutralize that weapon and how to defeat the enemy? What if you had all that information? Would you make the effort and would you take the time to study? You see, what we're going to see in Genesis 3 and what's true for all of us today is that the strategy that Satan has to defeat us as men is to cause us simply to ignore these words of instruction. Because the Bible is clearly everything you need to lead your family. It tells you everything you need to know about the enemy and how to successfully counter his assault on your family. And so what we're going to do this morning is take just a few minutes and go back and look at the very first point man. And the strategy the enemy had to destroy his family, because it's the same for us today. We're going to look at the dangers, just like Adam faced, the dangers that we face, and how the enemy plans to destroy us. Genesis chapter 3, we won't read the entire story, but let's, let's look in verses 1 through 13 of Genesis chapter 3. Now the servant was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. 
But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, for food that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Now, I I don't think that's how he said that. I think it was a bit more accusative. Who told you? The woman that you gave me. That's probably more how he said it. That's just my interpretation. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So here you've got God. God has had a perfect plan. He's had them in a, in a perfect place. But then disobedience, which resulted in judgment. We didn't read the rest of the story, but you know that Adam and Eve were put out of the garden, never to return. They could never live in that perfect place again. Life became hard. She would have pain in childbirth. He would only draw uh, nourishment or get food from the ground from the sweat of his brow. There was loss of hope, loss of life. What were they thinking? And how how did they fall for that? Same way that we do. First of all, a failure to recognize that there's an enemy who has a plan to deceive and disrupt and destroy. And secondly, and more importantly, the failure to follow God's clear instruction that was designed to protect them. Now, it's helpful in battle if you know the plan and strategy of the enemy. So let's look at that very briefly this morning out of this Genesis 3 passage. Look at what Satan did here. And understand his basic plan and strategy with Adam and Eve is the same for us. The very first thing he did is he confused the Word of God. Look back in verse 1 that we just read in chapter 3. He said to Eve, did God actually say you can't eat of any tree in the garden? Now, is that what God said? Certainly not. God had told Adam when he put him in the garden that all of it was for him for his enjoyment. He could eat from any tree in the garden except the tree that was in the center of the garden. But Satan immediately begins to confuse the word of God when he asks Eve, did God say you can eat from any tree in the garden? And and it worked. He confused her. In verse 3 she says, well, God said we couldn't eat of this one tree. In fact, we can't even touch it. That's not what God said either. But Satan confused her about what God had said. He confused her about the word of God, the instruction of God. And in her confusion, she didn't really know what God had said. Men, let me ask you a few questions this morning. Did God really say, you have to sacrifice for your family? You have to put your own want and needs aside. You have to sacrifice the things that you'd like to do. You have to sacrifice your time. Did God really say when you come home from work exhausted that you can't just kick back and recline over your glass of tea watching sport? Did God really say that? Ephesians 5.25. Now, men, we know part of Ephesians 5 because we all well know that God told our wives to submit to us. But in 525, after the wives were told to submit to their husbands, husbands were told to love their wives just as Christ loved the church. How much did Christ love the church? He gave himself up. He died for the church. Is that sacrifice? Men, did God really say that we are responsible for the spiritual growth of our family and specifically our children. I mean, really, that's the church's responsibility. 
the pastor and the children's pastor and the youth pastor and the Sunday school teachers, that's their responsibility, right? Did, did God really say that we're responsible for that? Ephesians 6 and chapter 4, God said, fathers, don't exasperate or don't frustrate your children. And I used to think that was talking about me picking on my kids all the time, teasing them and picking at them. Here's the whole verse. Men don't, fathers don't exasperate, don't frustrate, don't anger your children. Instead, raise them in the instruction, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. What causes children to be frustrated and angry and exasperated? What causes children to have a hard time in life? What causes, have you noticed in our society, those of you who've, who've been around long enough, it's probably just been in the last 20 years, there's this seething anger below the surface, especially in men. All of a sudden, some guy that every neighbor thought was just a normal guy, kind of quiet, reserved to himself, goes and blows something up or shoots something up, and nobody knew he had all that seething anger. You know where a lot of the seething anger below the surface comes from? Exasperation, anger, and frustration from men, others as well, daughters as well, but primarily men who grew up in a home with a father who was absent, maybe not due divorce, maybe he lived in the home, but he was absent, he wasn't connected to his children. And for our purposes as godly men, what angers and frustrates children the reason our sons don't know how to cope with life and be godly men is that we haven't trained them in the instruction and the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Men were told to do that. Did moms help with that? Absolutely. But the responsibility was given to men. Did God really say divorce is wrong? Malachi chapter 2, verse 16, God says, I hate divorce. Now, let me give it to you from the Greek, translate it for you. Ready? Write this down. I hate divorce. Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11, a wife should not separate from her husband, a husband should not divorce his wife. Now listen, the message is not about divorce today. I'm just giving you examples about what happens when we don't follow God's plan, and I don't need to lay out for you what happens with divorce in our culture. Did God really say we're not to divorce? Absolutely, no question about it. It's clear in Scripture. Now, um, let me just say a quick word to the kids, lest you think you're getting off. I'm just beating on mom and dad today. Did God really say I have to obey and honor my parents? Listen, does God know my parents? They're crazy. That exclusion's not in there. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your parents. God really said it. Men, or let me, let me call you this morning point men. Do you know God's word? Because if you don't know God's word, Satan can easily confuse you about what God has said. Here's the second thing he does. He confuses you about God's word, and then he just comes right out and contradicts the truth. Once he's confused you, he's just flat out going to lie to you. Look back in verse 4. After Eve was confused about what God had said, Satan tells her in verse 4, You will not die. What did God say would happen if they ate from the tree in the garden? He said they would what? Die. Satan says, look, you have no clue what God said, and furthermore, you're not going to die. Verse 5, he basically tells her, God is not a good God. The whole reason God won't let you eat from that tree in the garden is he doesn't want you to know what he knows. He knows something that you don't know, and that's exactly right. God didn't want them to know about good and evil. They knew good. He didn't want them to know evil. God's not going to keep his word. You don't have to worry about it. There's no consequence. There's no punishment to your disobedience. God's just keeping you from the best. You know that families are breaking up in our culture because we think there's no consequence. I can't tell you how many times I've heard, well, the kids are resilient. They'll be fine. 
can I tell you that after 50 years, they won't be fine? 50 years after you walk out on your family, 50 years after you separate or divorce, your kids will not be fine. The truth about the breakup of the, fam of the family is that no one is better off, not even the one who leaves. You know why? Because you take your biggest problem with you when you leave your home. In our no-fault divorce culture, it's easier to say, I married the wrong person, than it is to say, I've got some issues in my life that God needs to work on, that I need to fix, and that I need to change. A lot of dads leave the family because they don't understand the truth. You know, you know what? They're not, they're not happy in their home. They're not happy in their family. And their thought process is, well, God made me, God, God made life for me to enjoy. I deserve to be happy. God wants me to be happy. No, in your marriage, God is more concerned about you being holy, about you sacrificing for your wife and for your children. So Satan confuses us about what God's Word has said. He contradicts the truth. He, he lies to us. And then the end result, you see in verse 7 and forward from there, he creates absolute chaos. At the moment they ate from the tree, their eyes were open to what? To the degradation of sin. Their eyes were open to evil. And so they move from a world of perfection to a world of, of shame and, and fear and blame. They were ashamed. They, they were afraid of the God who made and loved them. What did they do? They, they hid from him. Now they're hiding in, in this perfect place in the garden. They're not able to enjoy all that God has done for them, all that God has given them. They're, they're trying to meet their own needs. I'm sure in that moment, along with that fear, was the recognition that life would never be the same again. It was like Humpty Dumpty being shattered Never going to be put back together again, never the same again, no hope, no future. Yesterday when I was in Texas, before we left to drive home, we stopped and had lunch at Jason's Deli. And when I got up to go to the salad bar, I'd, I'd been studying, and I left my notes on the table, and Anna Grace, my youngest daughter, picked them up and read them. And I didn't find out until later in the car, Luann said, hey, Anna Grace was reading your message. She said, it's, it's, it's a downer. Sin is a downer, isn't it? Here's what's cool. Look in verse 8. God came in the midst of their chaos. It says he came walking in the garden in the cool of the day. You think about the cool of the day. The cool of the day is kind of toward the end of the day. It's when you get home from work and the sun is setting and you sit out on your porch in the swing and the rocker, the cool of the day, the day is kind of ending. God came walking into the garden in the cool of the day. Now, for Adam and Eve... The cool of the day was not a pleasant moment. Here's what they thought. We got away with it. They had eaten from the tree. They had made it through the day. They'd not been caught. But you can count on the fact that when you're disobedient to God, especially as a child of God, he's going to come walking in the cool of your day. But why did God come walking into the cool of the day? Well, he asked the question, where are you? And who told you? Did he know where they were? Absolutely. Did he know what had happened? Certainly. The whole reason he asked those questions was to give them the opportunity to confess, to come clean, to make the relationship right, because God doesn't want to live in animosity toward us. Isaiah 118, come, let us reason. This is God's words. Come, let us reason. When you've sinned, when you've broken fellowship, when you've rebelled, when you've walked away from me, I want you to come. I want you to bring your sin to the table. You can't hide from me. You can't deal with your sin on your own. The, the, the guilt alone, David said the guilt was like a fire in his bones consuming him. God says, listen, when you've sinned, don't hide from me like Adam and Eve in the garden, but come, come, let us reason, God says, though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they're crimson, they'll be like wool. So God comes walking in the midst of their chaos in the cool of the day. He comes to the garden. He asks the questions to give them opportunity. 
And can I tell you that any time we, we gather as the body and, and we hear the word of God, God is giving opportunity. And we don't, we don't want to miss that. So we, we've looked here in Genesis 3 at what Satan did to defeat Adam and Eve. But men, let's be very clear. Satan could not defeat Eve until he first defeated Adam. On patrol, the point man is out front. The point man has to be taken out before the enemy can assault those behind him, those that he's leading. And and men, it's easy to miss, and and we want to blame our wives. We want to say it was the woman. Or we blame society. We blame the horrible job our parents did. Or, 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 or we blame the culture that we live in. Like Adam, we say it was the woman. If you still got your Bible open to Genesis 3, turn back, or maybe it's on the same page. Look in chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Look what's happening there in chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. God has placed Adam in the garden. He's given him dominion over all of that, and he's given instruction to Adam. And in verses 16 and 17, he gives the command to Adam that all that's in that garden is for him, but it's there in verses 16 and 17 that the command is given. You can eat from all of the trees in the garden except the one at the center of the garden. Do you see that? Do you see who the command is given to? Let your eyes kind of scan on down past verses 16 and 17 and see the next significant thing that happens in the creation account. The command is given to Adam. Then God says it's not good for man to be alone. And then God creates Eve. So, to whom was the command given? Adam. Eve was not even present when the command was given. The command and the responsibility to obey God was given to Adam. Chapter 3, verse 6, where we just read in the account. Adam wasn't off on a hunting expedition while Eve was home baking an apple pie and sneaking the sinful fruit into the pie. He didn't come home to dinner unawares and didn't know what was going on. Where was he when Eve took from the fruit of the tree and ate it? It says she gave some to her husband, not later at dinner. When did she give some to her husband? Right then, because he was with her. We can't blame anyone else. The ultimate responsibility is ours as men and God is going to hold us accountable. So men, do you understand that Satan has a plan to destroy your life, destroy your family, and cause you to spend the rest of your days on this earth in in complete chaos? And do you believe that God also has a plan? That his plan is your best, that his his plan is reward. Men, listen, everything everything we just looked at, everything we just studied in Genesis 3 came down to, to one thing, Adam's failure to obey God's word. That's it. God told Adam, you can eat from every tree in the garden, all this is for you, all this I made for you, for your enjoyment. The only thing you cannot do, the only thing, So many people want to say, well, the Bible's just a book of a bunch of don'ts. The Christian life is such a downer. There's all these things you can't. God only told Adam one thing, don't eat from that tree. And yet that's the very thing that Adam did. He failed to obey the one word of instruction that God gave him. Here's a good memory verse to walk out of here with today. And it's it's very simple. All of you can learn it in an instant. James chapter 1, verse 22 Listen, men, be hearers of the word, not doers only. Be hearers of the word, not... Boy, I said that totally backwards. (laughs) Shows how well I know my memory verses. Was anybody going to correct me on that? 
Be doers. Hey, can you guys edit that part out so I don't look stupid when this goes out over the waves? Be doers of the word, not hearers only. Let me say that again. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. I want all the men who are much smarter than me this morning to say that with me, okay? Ready? Be doers of the word, not hearers only. One more time. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. Now listen, you understand the part about being doers of the word, but listen, you can't be a doer unless you've been a hearer. Okay? You can't be a doer unless you've been a hearer. Yes, you don't need to just hear and say, oh, that was a cool word, that's really neat, and go on. You need to do what you hear, but first you have to hear. Here's what I'm trying to say to you men this morning. Here's the one application this morning, the one simple thing. Get in the Word. If you don't know the Word, if you're not hearing the Word, you're not going to do the Word. If you don't know the Word, if you're not hearing the Word, Satan will come in and confuse, and he'll contradict, and he'll bring total chaos in your life. Men, if you're not digging into the Word for, for yourself and for your family, you're being disobedient to the call of God on your life. If you're not digging into the Word as a man, you're being disobedient to the call of God on your life. Yes, be a doer of the Word, but you're not a doer of the Word until you're a hearer of the Word. You don't hear the Word just by showing up here on Sunday. You hear the Word by daily spending time in the Word and letting the Spirit of God who wrote this book speak it into your life. If you're not digging into the Word of God, you're being disobedient to the call of God on your life. Men, you are the point man. Lives depend on you now and for eternity.